Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first uh, journal club. Uh, today, we will have uh, Dr. Marion Ugel here with us. And as you know, New York's a company committed to research and researchers. So we had this idea to create a space and discuss uh, recent papers that can help a lot the, the FNIRS community. Uh, the first paper we chose is then this best practice of, of on FNIRS. And this paper was written by a representative group of leaders in the field, actually. And it was designed to provide some guidelines for who is starting the research or already doing some research, but kind of bring all the community to the same page. And we find this, this idea super interesting. Uh, um, today we have here the first author, which is Dr. Mary Ugel. And if you have any paper that you'd like to also you know, see the discussion about or see the author present, please let us know. We are you know, looking for, for awesome papers to, to feature here. Uh, today, uh, before I, I present our, our guests here, I would just like to present our backstage. So I will be the moderator. We have also Milan and uh, we have actually Alina in the backstage as well. So they are gonna help us and um, you are all muted. Um, questions are welcome at any time. Please use the GoToWebinar panel for that. Uh, the content will be available on our website in the upcoming days. And if you have any further questions, just send us an email at consulting at newrex.net. We are happy to hear from you. Okay, and our guest today is uh, Dr. Mary Ugel. She's a neuroscience researcher at Neurophotonic Center, Boston University. She's an active contributor and involved in the field of FNIRS uh, research. She has worked on developing advanced FNIRS signal processing algorithms and focus on removal of systemic, physiological, and motion artifacts. Um, as you already know, she's one of the senior developers of Homer 3 and Atlas Viewer. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Miriam, please, yes. uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thanks. Also, once I start, can you confirm you hear my voice and my slides? That would be great. Yes, I can okay. hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me show my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, wherever you are on the planet. Um, in this talk, um, uh, I will uh, give a summary of our best practices for FNIRS publication paper and highlight some uh, important considerations in FNIRS studies. Um, this paper is a product of a joint effort of more than 20 FNIRS researchers, uh, as listed here. And we were motivated by the fact that we can increase the reproducibility, reliability, and traceability of um, the scientific work we are we are doing um, through presenting our methods and findings uh, in a comprehensive and transparent way. Um, to motivate further, uh, I would like to briefly talk about the neuroimaging analysis replication and prediction study uh, that is published last year in Nature. Um, it's, it's critical to report methods uh, properly as uh, different analysis pipelines may result in uh, different statistical outcomes, as this study uh, proves. Um, in this study, authors shared fMRI, uh, an fMRI dataset which uh, consists of data from 108 individuals um, recorded during a decision-making task and uh, with 70 independent research teams. So the teams were instructed to analyze the data uh, as they usually would do in their own research laboratory, laboratories. Um, they were all given uh, the same nine different hypotheses to test. And they were asked to report um, uh, whether each hypothesis was supported on the basis of a whole brain um, corrected analysis uh, or not, and provide the details of the methods of uh, the analysis that they did. And with this study, uh, authors were able to evaluate the impact of uh, analytical uh, flexibility uh, on fMRI results in the wild. Um, so instead of um, one group analyzing a one, data, uh, one data set with different pipelines, they actually go to the wild and ask different groups to analyze this data set. 
Um, so here is the main finding from the study. Um, let's uh, now focus on the coral circles. Um, the rest of the dots are from a market analysis and you can refer back to the paper if you uh, are interested in uh, what they mean. Um, so uh, the rates uh, of reported significant findings varied across hypotheses. So the results were uh, consistent across groups for only one hypothesis, um, H9 here, H5 here. Um, and uh, another three, um, H7, 8, and 9, three hypotheses, they showed no significance for most of the teams. And for the remaining five, the results varied quite a lot. Um, and we are talking about the exact same data set, same hypotheses. So this is a really a critical result. So the main findings from the study were that no two teams chose identical workflows among these 70 teams. Um, there was a variation in the results uh, of hypothesis tests, uh, even for teams whose statistical maps uh, were very similar uh, at, the, at, at an intermediate step. Um, and this is an interesting finding, uh, which shows that maybe it's beneficial to report uh, untresholded uh, results as well. Um, and the results prove um, that different data analysis pipelines can have substantial effects on scientific conclusions and thus validating and sharing the details of pipelines is, uh, is critical. And another note is that um, the scientific community actually can brainstorm on coming up with a robust pipeline, which is out of scope of this of the paper I'm going to talk about, but it's an important point. Um, okay, now um, let's move on to the best practices paper. Um, just a heads up slide to emphasize that good practice in, in performing the study, um, the data analysis and reporting the results are very much interleaved. Although we aim to focus on good practices in reporting uh, in this publication, uh, we had to visit a good practice in performing the study and data analysis as well. Um, uh, so I would also like to point out that the effect is not one directional. Uh, for instance, um, if you start data analysis after running your first subject, you can notice missing steps in your study. Or once you start writing, you can notice a wrong parameter that you use or missing step in your analysis. So it's, it's a, it's a bi-directional uh, feedback. Um, let's start with the introduction uh, of our papers. Um, we can broadly say that um, there are two different types of original uh, research articles, at least in the neuroscientific uh, field, uh, FNIRS field. Um, one that presents a new technology or, or a new method um, and of analysis, and one that presents neuroscientific uh, finding. So the introduction so uh, section for the technological papers or the methodological papers uh, should describe how and why the novel te technique or, or the method differs from existing ones. What's the novelty of this, this work? And it should also report what advantages are expected with the new technology uh, or the new method and how um, the method has been validated. For instance, if this is a new um, data analysis met method, it's, it's good to uh, compare this method with the existing methods and show that it actually does a better job in um, fixing, for instance, motion artifacts or removing the confounding signals. Um, on the other hand, the paper is dealing with neurological or neurocognitive questions. Um, the introduction um, should focus on how the research question uh, makes an advance in our understanding of brain function or, or a brain disease um, or, or some neurocognitive mechanism. And also, if relevant, um, we should provide the rationale for using FNIRS or, or other neuroimaging modalities. Um, for instance, if, if the study requires subjects to be in an ecologically valid environment. So this uh, slide is an overview of the methods, and then I'm going to go more into detail um, uh, section by section. Um, in general, method section um, will ideally have um, these uh, subsections, the participant demographics, the ethical committee approval statement, um, the details of the experimental paradigm, the system used and acquisition details, uh, the pre-processing steps, including the statistical methods that are used, um, 
and also, as we all know, pictures speak louder than words. Um, so even if you have everything in the text, uh, it's worth making figures showing, uh, for instance, uh, the measurement um, setup, for instance, an original photograph from measurement session or, or a drawing, um, or and a figure showing the experimental protocol, um, F nearest probe layout on the head uh, and its sensitivity map, ideally. And um, if the signal processing pipeline, for instance, if it's a novel method and it involves um, new steps, novel steps, it's good to have a block diagram uh, of the um, processing pipelines. Um, just a highlight uh, here on, on demographics. Um, it's worth noting that apnea signal quality may be affected by hair properties and skin, skin uh, pigmentation. And so selection of participants based on this can result in the lack of generalizability. Um, and so uh, it may be re relevant to report the ethnicity distribution of the sample, uh, pro provide uh, our exclusion criteria. And in cases where data from some participants uh, were excluded, um, was excluded from the final analysis, uh, the demogra demographics of the final sample um, uh, should be provided. And another highlight on, on the setup, um, there can be some experimental conditions that may have influenced the participant's performance during uh, the data acquisition step. Uh, for instance, um, long setup procedures, um, acquisitions under unideal conditions, um, or um, some distractions like environmental distractions during the task. So in such cases, it's also worth not providing this information uh, in the method section. Um, now let's go uh, through FNIR's instrument specific information we will need to provide. Um, we want to provide the manufacturer information. Uh, we typically denote the company name and the location in parentheses uh, right after the uh, name of the system. We want to uh, provide the mode of operation, where it's a continue, whether it's a continuous wave system, a frequency domain system, or a time domain system, for instance. In this case, this is a, uh, this paper, they use a continuous wave system. Um, we want to report the wavelengths of the system used um, as commercial FNIRS instruments um, may have like different wavelengths. Um, uh, the sampling frequency of the system, uh, the number and type of optodes and the resulting channels. Uh, here they I mentioned they used um, 16 dual wavelength laser diodes um, at um, 7, 8, and 850 nanometers, for instance. Um, source detector distances, and um, if the data uh, conversion to chromophore concentration is automatically done by the instrument software, we also uh, want to mention the uh, method for conversion and the parameters used. Um, okay. Um, so clear documentation of the probe uh, is also very important, probe design as well as probe placement. Um, so this will increase the reproducibility of our results across participants and across studies. Um, so we would like to report the following information regarding the probe. Uh, first of all, it's highly recommended that we have a diagram of the probe geometry that shows how the source and detector are, are placed on the head and, and a photograph also would be very helpful if um, there is one. Um, also, um, it's worth noting how the probe is placed on the head to make sure uh, consistent probe placement across participants. In this study, uh, they particularly said, uh, you know, they chose um, a cap size according to the subject and also um, when they were putting the cap, they were careful about um, matching CZ location and ear location, uh, like make sure that um, they uh, place the cap uh, according to some, you know, uh, cranial landmarks. And um, if a participant-specific registration has been performed, um, we should report what has been used. Is it through uh, 3D positioning data or using head circumference? In this case, um, in this paper, they have used a 3D digitizer to get the 3D locations of the optodes. Um, and if, uh, again, we have this information, how did we do the registration, the steps uh, of the registration, how the probe is registered on the head surface. And also it's useful to have a table showing optode or channel locations uh, with respect to known landmarks. Um, in this case, in this paper, they 
Um, they uh, show MNI coordinates of each channel um, and uh, brain levels and the corresponding Broadman areas. Um, it's really useful to have something like this in the paper. So um, if the paper is a hardware development paper, of course, we will need uh, many other details about the new device. Um, uh, we want to report the type of the light source, uh, its wavelengths and the emitted power per unit area. Here, this is a TDDCS um, device. Um, they mention, you know, they use this monolithic um, distributed break refractor laser at uh, 852 nanometers. So they give more information about the laser. Um, uh, also, we know that uh, nearest light um, exposure uh, to eye and skin uh, should remain uh, within universally accepted safety norms, uh, such as the international standard for safety of laser products. The paper should also report the safety limits of the, uh, the novel system uh, according to these standards. Uh, this will also help um, um, classify the device. In this case, uh, for instance, in this paper, they say it's safe for human use when uh, diffused over an area larger than one millimeter uh, square. Um, we also need to report the type of the light detector, uh, whether it's a pin photodiode, avalanche photodiode, or, or the others, uh, the detector's configuration, single or um, photodiode array, its sensitivity profile, uh, for the specific wavelengths of the device, um, the gain of the detector, the, the noise equivalent power, um, as well as um, the skin interface style, uh, whether it's a direct contact detector or it uses light guides or fibers. Um, a hardware block diagram um, depicting connections and control mechanisms is also very useful. It's giving um, the big picture uh, for the new device. Um, as, and measures um, taken to prevent external contamination across and crosstalk across channels um, can also be mentioned. Um, here uh, they say um, they used wavelength, um, optimum uh, wavelength combination um, to minimize the crosstalk. But there can be other measures as well. And um, finally, a circuit diagram of the key components uh, also uh, is very useful. Another highlight here, um, I would like to uh, mention that uh, we have uh, IEC ISO standards for FNIRS equipment. Um, and this is an effort led by Dr. Hydron Watmitz. And these standards actually provide performance assessment guidelines for FNIRS equipment. Um, and these tests uh, in, in, these standard, uh, in these standards are based on phantoms with realistic optical properties and internal aperture uh, so that one can mimic the change in hemoglobin concentrations. And with this uh, phantom, um, there are step-by-step um, -step guidelines on how uh, you can do some uh, tests, some performance assessment tests, such as um, looking at the signal-to-noise ratio, uh, signal stability, and um, crosstalk. And there are other uh, protocols that provide uh, such comprehensive uh, performance uh, characterization as well um, uh, for the FNIRS devices, such as MedFAT or a BIP or a neuro protocol. Um, so when we do a uh, phantom test, of course, we want to report some of the specific details uh, of the phantom tests performed. Um, uh, the phantom type, obviously, here, uh, for instance, in this paper, they use the silicon phantom. Um, also, it's uh, important to provide the optical properties uh, of the phantom here, uh, for instance, on, on, in this table um, on the right. Um, they provide the mu A and mu S prime uh, for, the, uh, for the silicon phantom that they use. Also, uh, of course, uh, you need to provide um, the source detector separations that you use during the tests and, and the obvious the results of the tests. So now we are switching to um, signal processing uh, from the details of the hardware. Um, the first pre-processing step in FNIRS data analysis is the signal quality check of the row of signal. 
and the noise in F near signal uh, may originate either from the measurement system, um, for instance, due to the light source instability, uh, electronic noise or shot noise, or of, uh, it can be of uh, physiological origin um, or head and body motion, uh, which uh, we will be referring to as uh, the confounding signals. Um, and the F nearest signal quality check uh, on noise uh, can be tested either uh, by a simple SNR check and, or by obtaining cardiac power at each channel. Um, cardiac is a good indicator of signal quality, and one can, uh, you know, one can have a high SNR at a saturated channel, uh, but it doesn't mean we measure physiology. So it's, it's always good to see um, if we can see a cardiac change. Uh, in our signal to make sure we are uh, measuring uh, physiology. Um, and is it likely that different measurement channels will fail to criteria for different participants? Uh, we should report the number of participants remaining for each channel. Um, uh, for, for instance, if you have like 20 subjects, uh, but for that particular channel, you're left with only four good ones. Uh, the information from this channel, the, the, the results that you get cannot be representative of all 20 subjects. So it's important to report uh, the final sample that you have for each channel. Um, we also know that FNIR is prone to motion artifacts and one will deal with motions in data either by excluding the trials adjacent to motion artifacts or use one of the motion correction algorithms in the literature. Um, if an exclusion route is taken, it's good practice to report the number of trials left that will be further analyzed. And if a method of correction is used, the method, the citation, and the relevant parameters should be reported. In this case, they use the wavelet correction, and there is the citation, and they it has only one parameter, so it's, they also report the parameter they used. After the pre-processing, uh, the next step will be the use of uh, modified Beer-Lambert law uh, to convert uh, optical density to concentration. Um, and we want to report uh, whether a pad length used, and if so, the value. And here is an example. Um, they use the pad length factor of five, and they provide the, part the citation in this paper. Another highlight um, on, on um, hemoglobin units, um, in optical density concentration conversion, one option is to use a differential pad length factor um, taken from literature. In that case, uh, we will be reporting the results in chains in chromophore concentration in molar concentration units, uh, for instance, micromolars or molars. And this option takes into account the wavelength and source detector distance dependence uh, of the pad lengths. And so it's more appropriate if you have uh, channels of different separations. And the other option is not to use pad length during conversion. Um, and in this case, the signal chains are presented as the products of concentration chains and new pad length. So in units of molar concentration times distance. So uh, for instance, micromolar centimeter or micromolar millimeter. Um, this approach may be more appropriate when a single uh, separation is used. If all your channels have the same distance, um, you can use um, this. Uh, one thing, last thing to uh, note is that um, the resultant hemodynamic change can be orders of magnitude different depending on the choice in this step. So if you uh, do not do the conversion, your um, values will be uh, much larger. So, it, so it's critical to report what has been used so that there is no confusion as to why uh, this paper published um, such high HBO values versus the other paper. After the conversion, uh, we will have the HRF uh, estimation step. Uh, one option to perform is to perform uh, a simple block averaging. Um, this uh, option um, has no a priori assumption about the shape of the HRF. This is just simple averaging. Um, uh, this is uh, this is one limitation, of course, uh, because it, it's um, limited in terms of dealing with the confounding signals. Uh, you cannot really model uh, the confounding signals. 
The other option is to use um, a general linear model, uh, GLM. Um, it, uh, GLM represents um, the data uh, as a linear uh, combination of uh, distinct components and allows modeling uh, different confounding factors in the nearest signal along with the hemodynamic response. If a GLM approach is used, we want to report uh, the regressors modeled along with their parameters. Uh, for instance, uh, you may have a regressor for short separation channels, uh, measurements, you may have a regressor for drift correction, and you may have regressors for the HRF itself. Um, we want to report the method used to estimate the weight of the regressors, and we uh, want to um, report the number of trials included in the final analysis we did. Um, also wanted to mention uh, about the HRF model. Um, so broadly speaking, we have two options to model the HRF, uh, fixed models and flexible models. Um, fixed models can be used uh, if we have confidence in the expected shape of the HRF uh, for that specific experimental task and for the specific brain region. And uh, for instance, we may have this information from FNIRS or FMRI, FMRI literature. Um, so we, we are confident that we know how the brain response would look like and we use that shape. The advantage of uh, fixed models is that um, they will increase the statistical power, you have less to model, um, and if fixed models are used, um, the methods of the paper should, uh, of course, include the model and its parameters, uh, as well as a justification for the model preference, well, like uh, citing the papers in the literature that shows, you know, the shape has been shown like this. Um, flexible models, uh, of course, if you don't know the HRF shape, um, it, if it's an exploratory study in a different group of population, like infants or um, a, a population with the disease, uh, using a fixed model uh, can result in a loss in statistical power and, and can bias the results. And in such cases, um, we want to prefer flexible, flexible models because uh, they allow capturing the true temporal characteristics of the HRF. Um, once we have decided on our regressors, um, we um, estimate the weight of the regressors using a least squares method that minimizes the sum of the squared differences between the actual and fitted values. Um, so be between our measurements and between our model, we want to minimize the error. Um, a GLM assumes that the errors are uncorrelated between observations. However, uh, the noise in FNIRS data is, is correlated. Uh, this is due to the strong uh, physiological components such as uh, the cardiac signal respiration variation in blood pressure. And this results in uh, temporal correlations between the residuals in the regression model. So uh, FNIRS signal actually violates the main assumption in the GLM. And so researchers um, should follow one of the three strategies below and, and uh, to overcome this. Uh, one approach, uh, the simplest one, is to, to pre-filter the data to remove confounding signals such as uh, physiological confounds and motion artifacts before uh, the GLM is employed. An even better method will be to pre-whiten the signal. Um, you can use an autoregressive uh, model, for instance. And another approach is to pre-color the signal. And either way, whichever method has been used, it's important that we are aware of this issue and report uh, how we dealt with it in the paper. And the next step will be uh, to test the null hypothesis, whether the coefficients are uh, significantly different from uh, zero or not. Um, Removal of uh, confounding signals uh, deserve uh, its, its own place, um, as not dealing with them can have uh, important scientific consequences. Um, for instance, um, they may result in uh, false positives, which means wrongly assigning a detected hemodynamic change to functional brain activity, uh, or they may result in false negatives, which means they can mask brain activity when it's present. And in the paper, we outline different ways on how to deal with them. Uh, one approach is to perform filtering. 
um, high frequency components in the signal, uh, for instance, instrument noise, cardiac pulsation, if you're not interested in cardiac pulsation, um, they can be filtered out using a low pass filter. And, and lower frequency components, such as uh, very low frequency oscillations, and can be filtered out using a high pass filtering or adding a drift factor in the GLM uh, as a regressor uh, to model the low frequency oscillations in the data. Um, and mid frequencies, uh, of course, it's a relative term. Um, a respiration, mere ray oscillations, for instance, they fall into the same frequency range as the hemodynamic response and cannot simply be removed uh, by uh, band pass filtering. So we will need other uh, methods uh, or, uh, for instance, uh, different uh, instrumentation um, or other measurements to deal with these uh, mid frequencies and also the superficial hemodynamic chains. So yeah, another way is, uh, as I said, the instrumentation. Um, and this is especially critical for dealing with superficial hemodynamic chains uh, happening in the skull. Um, to achieve uh, depth sensitivity, uh, the FNIR setup uh, should contain um, source detector uh, pairs of different lengths and, and especially short separation um, uh, channels or detectors. Um, short separation channels are uh, typically around a centimeter for adults and half centimeter for infants. Um, these channels are mostly sensitive to hemodynamic chains in the extracerebral tissue layer. Um, and once we have the measurements, uh, they enable us to regress out the signal chains in the extracerebral layer uh, from the long separation chains. So long separation channels. Um, uh, the chains and the long separation channels are due to both uh, brain and scalp, and you can use this independent measure uh, from short separation uh, channels to remove um, the scalp, scalp effect. And this is uh, called uh, or commonly known as short separation regression. Another uh, approach or instrumentation approach will be using high density measurements, uh, diffuse that will allow us to do diffuse optical tomography type of um, analysis. Um, high density measurements, they use a very large number of channels and they overlap each other and so it provides some depth result measurements. And lastly, um, time domain near systems are also depth sensitive. Uh, they measure the time of flight of photons and the depth is uh, encoded in the arrival uh, of uh, time of the photons. And in cases where we have a data um, from a sparse probe with only long separation channels as a sub-ideal um, uh, condition, uh, we can employ some uh, data processing tools that can help remove some of the global physiological chains. Uh, for instance, we can approximate um, systemic chains uh, with the global component from the mean of all channels. Like we can take the average of all channels or long channels and remove that signal uh, from um, from the long channels uh, one by one. And then the, another approach is, is to use um, um, blind source separation methods such as um, independent component analysis or principal component analysis, uh, which decompose that near signals into its uh, brain and systemic components. And one last method uh, I would like to mention is to have external measurements uh, of some of the physiological chains, uh, could be respiration, uh, blood pressure chains. In such cases, we can use them as regressors in our GLM to remove the systemic component from our lung channels. And also, if you're interested, of course, having such measurements uh, will allow us to investigate relationships between these um, physiological measures and the FNIR signal. Um, and uh, this is a figure from the paper um, summarizing the uh, advantages and disadvantages of uh, methodological factors. Um, of course, uh, arrays containing only uh, long channels um, is, is a disadvantage. We want to have um, short and long channels and ideally also um, overlapping channels. Um, having a large scalp, skull, this is for adults, of course, uh, that will uh, contaminate uh, the brain signal more. That's a disadvantage. 
which we don't have in infants. And also paradigms um, they, uh, that likely to induce systemic physiological change. Um, these are also very critical because they can be uh, synced with the stimulus. Uh, you have a change in systemic physiology. When you have a change in brain response, it's really hard to differentiate the two. Um, advantages, uh, obviously having uh, long and short channels, uh, small scalp skull thickness, and if you have external measurements of systemic physiology, and, and if we use them to clean our data, um, these are all uh, advantages in, in methodological factors, which will improve the likelihood of obtaining signals from brain. Um, a short note on uh, statistical tests. Any claim in the paper should be supported by statistical test analysis. Um, we don't want to say this value is higher than this value. We want to say it's statistically higher other than uh, that we don't want to draw any conclusion from the data. Um, also reporting effect size and confident intervals uh, is preferable as they're uh, sample size free statistics so you can um, uh, more um, it, it will be easily uh, comparable with uh, other uh, studies. And of course tables and figures um, to present statistical results and improve readability. Um, Multi-channel FNIRS measurements, um, we know that come with the cost of high pos positive rates um, as we will be running our statistical tests on each channel uh, and this will increase uh, the risk of randomly assigning a channel as active or a significant change in one channel just because you know we had so many measurements and just randomly one of them came up to be active. And this issue is well known as a multiple comparisons problem. Um, in such cases, uh, we need to correct our results for multiple comparisons. Uh, there are various methods uh, to do that. And, and we have to adjust our, our P values uh, by the number of measurements. And uh, of course, uh, when we report, we want to specify um, the specific um, correction method that we used and the corrected p-values instead of uncorrected ones. Or we can present both. Um, another note, um, this is on, on connectivity, um, symmetrical vasculature anatomy uh, on scalp uh, may uh, strongly contribute to the uh, high correlations um, in long separation channels. And due to this, um, the most reliable approach for acquiring a connectivity data uh, will be through uh, adaptive result in instrumentation, such as um, a high density measurement uh, and applying DOT or uh, using uh, time domain nearest measurements. So we want to have some depth uh, resolution so that we are sure we are measure measuring the connectivity in brain, not uh, what we see in the skull. Um, in such cases, in such papers, we want to really report a specific procedure of how we dealt with physiological compounds from scope and um, how this issue can uh, significantly bias our, our results. And lastly, um, uh, we know that ethnears is not sensitive to deep cortical regions. Uh, of course, this may not be an issue for many FNIR studies, uh, but if we, we are talking about connectivity study and if we are interested in, in one particular network, um, which has um, nodes in deep layers, for instance, um, FDS measurements may not be ideal. Okay, so moving to image reconstruction, um, if, we, if one employs image, image reconstruction in their analyses, um, uh, following information um, should be provided in the paper. Um, the head anatomy provided by participant a specific uh, MRI uh, or, or if, if, he, if one uses atlas head, the atlas model, atlas head model used. In this case, authors use the MRI volume uh, of the participants. Um, we want to report the segmentation method and, and parameters um, and we want to uh, report how we did the mesh generation uh, and also uh, the number of uh, tissue regions and optical properties. Um, 
uh, also um, the optical array, how it's localized on the mesh anatomy, um, and uh, how the sensitivity profile uh, of the sources and measurements um, are, are uh, generated. And uh, finally, um, of course, uh, we want to report the inverse problem, the equation for the inverse problem. Um, in this case, uh, they used more perros uh, and, and also the regularization method. Uh, in this case, um, they report the values here. Um, alpha is the regularization parameter. They report what they use along with the equations uh, for the uh, inverse problem. Okay, so now, uh, we are moving to results uh, from the method section. Um, this is going to be uh, more brief. Um, results, we want to be concise and well organized. Um, uh, we want to report all results, um, positive or null. Uh, we, we don't want to bias uh, the scientific community, so we want to uh, present whatever we have. Um, results that have been published previously uh, should be clearly delimited from the new results. And um, both HBO and HBR uh, and the statistical outcomes uh, on a brain head template uh, should be shown uh, or ideally would be shown. And if um, one of the chromophores is used uh, for, for some reason, a strong justification uh, should be reported. Um, it's also good to report uh, oxy and deoxy time series uh, for each channel or, or ROI at the subject or group level. Um, and, and because they, these type of plots, like time series plots, they will uh, provide the temporal characteristics of HRF. And we can see the variability across different regions, the variability across, um, across subjects or different populations. And also uh, showing a HBO and HBR time series also give away the data quality. Um, discussion section um, and previous findings in the same or related fields, um, FNIRS, fMRI, EEG, uh, or other imaging modalities um, should be compared here uh, with the existing results. Um, one note is that causality should not be reported without evidence. Uh, correlation is not equal to causality. Uh, we want to report strengths and limitations of our study. Uh, strengths could be a novel experimental paradigm, uh, in depth study of a particular um, phenomenon, a large sample size, and uh, a novel hardware or signal processing tool um, or a method. Uh, and limitations could be small sample size, uh, presence of uh, confounding effects, um, limited brain coverage, and limited depth sensitivity, and potential next steps uh, of research uh, based on the presented work uh, can also be uh, discussed here. Our conclusion would be very concise, um, not more than one paragraph. Um, it should synthesize the main findings of the study and summarize its significance and impact for the field. Um, it should be consistent with the aims and with the results, of course. And references, um, relevant uh, review articles and original research um, specific uh, to the topic uh, should be listed here. And also uh, the previous work of the researchers that led to this work, this novel um, finding should also re be reported and all the references should be double checked. Um, so we don't want to say this paper gives this value and, and go back and we check this paper and there's no such value. So we don't want that. So we want to double check what we report from other papers. Um, supplementary, um, the last thing in the paper, um, uh, of course, um, data um, and metadata and code sharing, uh, they facilitate the reproducibility of the findings uh, because it allows researchers to independently test and verify our results. And also, uh, we can come up with new discoveries and interpretations from the same uh, data set. How do we share? Um, of course, data should be completely de-identified uh, before we share it. 
Um, it could be um, uh, as a supplementary to the journal if the journal has such option, or we can put this um, uh, put the data and the code on online repositories. And um, uh, of course, in the paper, we want to link um, to these um, repositories uh, in our methods section. Um, finally, um, sharing data in an openly and broadly accessible format facilitate data sharing across research groups, um, even if they use different acquisition systems or different processing pipelines, they will have the same data, uh, they could use the same data easily. Um, uh, the FNIRS uh, community is adapting a common FNIRS data format, the shared near infrared data format, um, in short SNRF. Um, we believe using SNRF format will facilitate data sharing in the FNIRS community in the a very uh, near future. Also, um, using standards um, like um, brain imaging data structure, uh, which is already adapted by um, fMRI and EEG community, and can also greatly facilitate data sharing across research groups. Um, openly sharing hardware software is also quite useful and, and can further speed up novel technological development. Um, some good examples, open NIRS and open FNIRS, um, where you can find the details of the instrumentation, um, for instance, um, online. Okay, so this is the last uh, slide, or before the last slide. Uh, we also have a checklist at the end uh, of the paper. Um, if you're writing a paper, or even if you're starting a study, uh, it can be helpful to go through the checklist to see uh, if there's something missing uh, or something you want to add uh, to your um, uh, date, uh, study. And thank you. Thank you very much, um, Miriam. Um, I can see you again. Uh, hey, thank you very much for the great uh, presentation. Uh, everyone, it's uh, thanking you as well and also thanking for the, the, the very good practical tips, I guess, that this paper brings uh, as well. Uh, so we do have some questions. I will uh, start. Um, so in the very beginning, you've talked a little bit about, you know, localization of the optos and how to, to prepare your, your montage and how to do that. And someone is just asking if you, if you have any recommendations or software that would help with the localization of optodes. And it specifically that's based on structure MRIs. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you... Yeah. Um, well, I know Homer and Atlas Viewer, and <laughs> I know Atlas Viewer does that. Um, you can import an MRI volume um that i think it needs to be processed with free surfer um and just import that and uh, register your um, um fnirs data to that um or the um the atlas had to that actual anatomy uh, of the subject and uh, you can use um that information to you know further analyze your data but uh, i'm sure uh, there are many other uh, packages that does that yeah. Um, on, on the same uh, line of softwares, uh, we also have a question about analysis software. Uh, for someone that doesn't have uh, a lot of programming background, so if you would also talk a little bit about that, of course. Yeah, why am I little... biased? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a bit biased, but... Uh... Yeah. I... Well, a bit biased, but also a little objective because um, I think Homer Homer is quite user friendly in general. Uh, so I, I would suggest that, and once they you know they're familiar with that environment and they learn what is this step is doing, what is this filtering is doing, then they can go ahead and use the other you know other packages as well. But it will be a good start to learn the basics. It is true. It does provide a GUI base that you, you don't need to program and stuff. So mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. might be helpful in this case. Um, we also have a question. So going to the design of a, of a, of a FNIRS uh, device and what would the, the role of, of what role phantoms can play in increasing the sensitivity of FNIRS devices? You talked a little bit about this. Yeah. So 
phantoms will allow you to do some tests without going to do your tests in human so you you will know exactly what change like what uh, um, absorption change you expect from the phantom because you know all the parameters so you can check whether um, your 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 device is performing uh, right um, and you can do as I said this SNR check or stability checks uh, using phantoms yeah um, so I think that's for the this this part um, going a bit more for the statistical approach of course i think this is a recurrent question as well what would be kind of the best statistical approach uh, when i am at you know i have my data it's good and what to do at that point um yeah so i know at which level are we talking about glm statistics or even higher level statistics uh, for the GLM, as I mentioned, just if we are careful about this, um, um, the fact that our error will be, you know, correlated uh, or that near signal is, uh, is you know, it, it has um, uh, frequencies that are really correlated. Um, we have to take um, steps to, you know, uh, take care of that. For instance, if we can take care of it, it during filtering, of course, it's more ideal if you do it during when you're doing the GLM, it, like uh, the, in the autoregressive models, uh, they do it uh, iteratively. They, uh, you, you do a GLM, you look at your error and uh, whiten it, and you redo the GLM, for instance. Uh, so I think that they are more robust uh, in terms of dealing with the uh, noise structure in, in FNIR signals or, um, compared to simple pre-filtering approaches. Um, there's also some, some questions on the, on the special population, which is infant, which is, of course, uh, where FNIRS is very wide uh, applied. So is there any considerations um, for infant or baby research, um, you know, either on the on the application caps preparation, but also for, for GLM and, and data processing? Yeah, so, well, in general, of course, with infants, we have the same issues we have in, in adults. And maybe they have of course more motion artifacts in the signal um it's it's harder to keep their head still um so that's an, an important consideration um their cardiac is higher but i don't think that's a big difference um just to remove the high frequency noise is not a big issue i think behaviorally maybe it's important for instance to have some uh, data like like having some eye tracking type of data is maybe more crucial when we are doing the FNIRS analysis, we can pick the trials that actually the, the infant attended the task because in adults, we are more sure that, you know, they are doing the task yeah. in infants, we are not that much sure. Um, yeah, but overall, scalp is uh, less of an issue. Um, but yeah, overall it's, it's the same, but yeah, there are some nuances. Yeah, yeah, well, but that that's uh, that's already very good consideration on on the task itself, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how how to control for that? Yeah. Um, one other um, question about um, again on the on the the correction for motion artifacts in child uh, research. Um, is there any type of filters that suits best, or any type of you know, I, I guess my favorite you know, question. Yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's actually a, another recurrent question, I guess, for for infant researchers. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, of course, I well, I don't want to give it. Well, I I, I can say that people generally use wavelet correction, although I don't think there's much difference between using this method versus the other method for infants versus adults, because um, well. That there is motion is just more in, in infants. Maybe one thing that I will care for about one of the methods, which I don't want to give any name, but if a method is has some assumptions about how HPO and HPR are related, uh, you don't want to make such an assumption during motion correction because in infants, um, 
they may not tip, have the typical hemodynamic response, HBO versus HBR, so you don't want to make an assumption and then based on an assumption, correct the data and change the signal. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, um, I think the rest of the methods should just mm -hmm. uh, work. And, and also, I, I guess this would apply for, for applying the GLM in the end, right? Kind of yeah. using yeah. the flexible, flexible. Uh, okay. uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, very good point. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. HB, HBO can go down or can be delayed. So we don't want to use rigid models. And, and okay. yeah. Yeah. Very helpful. Um, on a question, I mean, before, uh, any any uh, preparation, but uh, do you have any suggestions for calculating and reporting the SNR? And would and, and this person is wondering whether SNR should be considered an exclusion criteria? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we typically use SNR as an exclusion criteria. Of course, cardiac would be. Uh, more ideal, but for some wavelengths, you don't really see much cardiac, although there is physiological change. So you, you have some physiological change, but not necessarily strong cardiac power. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, um, we look at the SNR of the row intensity and, and set the threshold. So setting it, well, I don't want to give like one number that this SNR is good, um, but um, you can look at your signals and see the SNR for the good channels, like that you see nice cardiac, um, and then you know you can put your threshold according to those um, good channels. Mm, okay, so kind of in relation to a good channel in that subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the and the SNR you would calculate in the raw voltage values, right? Yeah, like the power okay. level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's an, another question also about uh, if you could provide your opinion on why that is that sample resolution, it's not often reported in the literature as it is it in the EEG. So the sample resolution of the ADI, I guess, a bit. Temporal? Yeah, the, the sample resolution, sorry. Sampling sample. resolution. Sampling resolution, yeah. I, like sampling rate? Is it something else there? That, that's exactly I I not sure. So the sampling it could be the sampling rate, but also the sample uh, of the AD um, converter as well. So if it's twenty four bits or or things like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know, but generally mm -hmm. people report sampling rate. Maybe they're asking the other one, which mm -hmm. I'm not sure why. Well, why mm -hmm. should it be reported? Why would we need that? I'm not sure mm -hmm. actually. But but this. Yeah, the sampling, the sample resolution, exactly. Yeah, again, sample resolution. Yeah, so it would be exactly what I, the, the AD sampling was sample mm -hmm. resolution. So if it's twenty four bit or or higher, it, it it is actually playing a bit role in the EEG field, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, not. sorry. Yeah, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Yeah. No, no worries. Uh, no worries. Um, we have uh, one more question. So. So whole head EGF NEARS measurements, um, what would you recommend for that um, positioning of short channel separation? And also if you should consider the thickness, for example, of the occipital bone. So is, I guess, you know, for, for, the whole, for the whole head, is there any special considerations, I guess? Um, well, what, what we typically do is, um, of course, we, we don't change the EEG locations, their standards, since we don't have any FNIR standards yet for, you know, opt-out locations. So we have the EEG um, placed and then we come up with a probe design that will fill out uh, the rest of the probe. Um, hmm. I mean, since they do not like interfere with each other, I don't see any issue on that. Um, like in terms of where to place. I'm not sure about the short separation part. Like um, in general, we want to have short separations homogeneously located over the whole mm -hmm. head, but I'm not sure what particularly they're asking about. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it's, short yeah. yeah, I guess it's exactly that, like how to, to spread this, the short separation. Mm -hmm. 
And 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 the the part of the thickness of the occipital bone, I'm I'm wondering when when you do the sensitivity profile, for example, that you can do in in, in Atlas Vera. This also takes into consideration some of these points, right? If you do a, a sensitivity profile for the whole head, you yeah. should have a good idea what's what you're capturing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but it seems like people can get um, a visual uh, response from the um, from that area, so. Maybe that's not a bit big issue, but I well I don't have much experience on that actually the occipital bone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have one question. Um, also, I don't know if you would know, but some we have a, a researcher that's on fMRI, and she uses a lot of uh, free surfer, and it's also wondering if. Uh, how much processing can be done using FreeSurfer? I don't know if you would know this question or not. Oh, you mean FNIRS analysis using FreeSurfer? Yes. Surfer? Is it uh, possible? Well, we, well, not the basic analysis, at least I don't think, uh, well, at least the pre-processing, I'm not sure if there is any platform that we can input FNIRS data, but we definitely use it for the, you know, registration of the, um, um atlas hat um or the registration of the uh, mri volume we use free surfer but for the pre-processing steps uh, i'm not sure i mean yeah I've, yeah i've used it only for fmri and i never use it for fnirs so yeah yeah true um yeah we, we do we do have um, a webinar with with Dr. Um, Wicks and Mesquita that we we did in the beginning of the the year, and I think that webinar has a lot of insights on how to do the the cap uh, not cap sorry probe positioning and how to to have you know how would this impact your research. So, I think that's also a good um, idea to take a look at that that webinar. He's uh, Professor Miskita is, is working a lot on this this types of, of, mm -hmm. of pro placement and how this influences. Mm -hmm. So this could also be be interesting for the person that asked the questions. Um, we are heading towards the end. I have two more questions that I would like to ask. So, and also for 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 it's interesting because we are talking about a paper for the best practice of FMIRS, and we ha we got a question of. What you should not do at all, like what mm -hmm. what would be a very very bad practice, and we should avoid at all costs. Which I find okay. an interesting question. So, okay. So I I wouldn't not look at my, my data and put it in a toolbox like blindly and just believe uh, the results that I get. That's what I wouldn't do. <laughs> that would be yeah, a never bad practice. <laughs> that's that's actually that's actually very interesting um yeah yeah and if you and, and also um we we here at nirx are very very interested in, in in helping with that so we do have a lot of uh, webinars a lot of um um tutorials on talking about you know all the toolboxes that are there and what do they do and we do all, always ask uh, the researchers to come here and talk so yeah, I, I, we also think that this is very important. You should should know your data and, and what you're doing, so you can report. So I, I like uh, one thing I, I like about these papers: the reporting part. It's not only focusing on, um, you know, just report. That's it. What you find, but you should also report. Maybe if you don't find anything on HBR data, but you report it and you show how the data is, and you show what you found, found, and you show all your know your 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 uh, interval as well not only the, the 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 value so i think that's that's all important things that yeah we should, we should be we should confident work. we should have confidence in our negative results as well like someone published negative and mine is also i don't see anything either so i'm like we are more confident as a community that there's nothing yeah. happening in that you know under that condition that's true okay i guess i guess that's it uh, yeah, so we have uh, one one research from from the SF Near Society that just congratulate you also, Miriam, and really like the recommendations that you did, and 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 uh, thank you for for representing everyone there. Thanks, thanks for listening. Thank you, thank you, for everyone. Uh, stay tuned for our next uh, webinars. We have a webinar on the MNE toolbox coming up. 
please stay tuned on the webinar pages in our in our um, web page. Uh, this webinar will be is being recorded and will be available uh, at the end of the week in our webinars page as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Mary Mujo, uh, again you. for being here with us, and see everyone next time. Mm -hmm. Bye.